This is the Generative Commons call on Wednesday, August 4th, 2021. <clears throat> I like that idea of the, the gratitude and the circle and the gifting. It sounds like a terrific social process. And I also agree with you, Jerry, most people are not aware of their superpowers. And of course, often the people who do think they have superpowers are uh, on the dark side. The, the opposite, the, uh, the, uh, the, <clears throat> the counter positive, I don't even know what the logical thing is, yeah. is, is often true as well. Yeah, yeah, alas. Well, with all, all the superpower <clears throat> films, there's always a, a dark side, so. Have you seen the series, The Boys? No, I haven't. <laughs> I believe I believe it's on Netflix. It's about it's about a bunch of superheroes that have become media celebrities, and oh. uh, this this woman discovers she has superpowers, joins them, and it turns out that they're all murderous assholes, and that behind behind the scenes they're all just trying to make more money. They're all like backstabbing each other, abusing the women. The whole thing. It's called The Boys, oh, and yeah. the premise is really cute and is pretty well executed. So anyway. <laughs> Yeah, that's what really happens when you're a superhero. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say that uh, another interesting thing is people are unaware of their superpowers, but hyper aware of their super weaknesses. You know, everybody oh, yeah. knows. Well, actually, I shouldn't say that. I mean, sometimes they're unaware of their, their weaknesses, too, yes. but they fear, they're, they're much more likely to fear weaknesses than they are to like feel good about strengths. That's compare, really interesting. Compare too. themselves to other people's superpowers. Like yeah. some things that they would say, oh, this person has a superpower. Oh, I don't, I'm, yeah. I'm no good that way. Right. And, and also I have this deficit, you yeah. know, over here. Yeah, cause, cause the idea of the weaknesses really makes a lot of sense. Um, and many of us are crippled by our weaknesses. And one of the best things a community can do uh, and, and, and this has been tried by a lot of personality profile systems, which are kind of unreliable and not very good, like uh, Myers-Briggs. But um, what a, a good thing a community can do is compensate for or fill in for one person's uh, weak, actual sort of weaknesses or, or you know, I, I'm, I'm not the best project manager. You do not want me doing your accounting or your project management. Trust me on that. Um, but I'm really great at designing an event and all that kind of stuff. So how do we how do we marry up with each other temporarily into projects or whatever, in a way that that fills in those gaps really nicely and turns us into super people as a team. And so and so, Stacy, I think there's a piece of this that might be really interesting in team forming uh, and other sorts of things. And I, you know, I don't know. And sometimes the more explicit you make some things, it doesn't help them. Right, so explicitness can be can be a boon and can be a problem. Uh, for example, in a directory of humans, um, knowing who the super ace connectors are doesn't necessarily help those connectors. Like they suddenly get flooded with a bunch of people saying, "Ooh, ooh connect me, connect me," and they they st they stop being able to just use their natural judgment about because what they're what what they're usually good at is meeting in a human, reading them in some way, and figuring out who they should talk to, what questions they look, they're probably looking at, I thought the whole, the whole kind of thing when you have good, good human judgment, like, like you, you get a read like that, right? And that, and if they're performing for you, it twists that around. Yeah, the labels can be killing, I, I totally agree. Something that goes through my head here as, as we say this is paralleling this to, um, uh, information sharing and the the difference. Well, I mean, when we're talking about recognizing superpowers and and giving gratitude and and compliments and doing the the supercut on in human terms, that's that's really great. Um, it has you know the the drawback of okay, we've just defined this member of the super team as, you know, super, uh, you know, um, master of ceremonies and this person as, you know, super getting things done, accounting and all these things. So they're kind of defined and, and maybe typecast a little bit and they don't get to do the thing that they're not so good at. So, you know, a little bit of, of danger there. 
Um, but thinking about it in terms of information, we're sort of, I'm imagining the idea that you have um, free form, a bunch of different pieces of information and everybody describing that piece of information in terms of, in terms of just a tag that could be, you know, as simple as the shape of this, i.e., you know, it's not a value judgment to say, hmm, this is circular and this is square. If we need to roll something somewhere, let's go with the circular one, you know. Um, and likewise with information pieces, just being able to say, um, this is this, this is that, and have a bunch of people define it in the different ways they choose to define it, um, which may or may not overlap, is the sort of information sharing, I don't know, you know, it's, it's I know it's certainly what factor is about and, and, and I know like what the OG does, like this is, this is something interesting, where does it fit? Um, so, Sorry, so this is sort of a rambling freeform thought, but just the idea of um, making a system both for people that is, is flat enough to say, I'm tagging this person with the characteristics I see so that they're findable and with pieces of information likewise. So there's a little bit of valuation and there's a little bit of um, crowd reinforcement like if a bunch of people tag you with a characteristic that is the same. I mean, some people might, you know, say something about your appearance, your height, your whatever. And, but a bunch of people would say, boy, you know, Jerry brings people together, you know? And, and so like that emerges from a, being a flat, a flat fact to being a flat fact that many people perceive about this person, ergo probably a superpower. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the same thing happening with, with pieces of information where there may be some mischaracterizations of something, but they won't happen often and the correct things will show up often and make that thing findable by that term. Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, no, I mean, and kind of obvious, but you know, oh, no, it's good. And LinkedIn but, sort of tries to do that with skills. And yeah. when, when LinkedIn skills were young and green, it was working pretty well. And then people just started sort of piling on. And I think it's lost a lot of its edge. Before that, there was a, 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 a service called connect.me, I think, uh, which I was part of. And they, they, they had a stormy, and I mean, like, like, like good storm kind of uh, debut before they actually ever opened the doors. They invited a bunch of people in to do this with and for each other. And that was really, really actually awesome. Cause I remember going and tagging different people with skills and that, it was, it was really frothy. And then that entity didn't make it. They didn't, they didn't actually manage to open the doors and take off. Um, and then one, one last thing here, which is uh, Pete has become a fan of Descript, which is a, a sort of basically a video and audio editing service where the first thing it does is it creates a transcript. It costs money, but it's like, it's insanely brilliant. The first thing it does is it creates a transcript of the recording, right? Then you can edit the transcript as if you were editing Google Doc and you can delete things, you can, you can sort of move things around and so forth and then hit show me this recording and it will stitch together the video beautifully for the newly organized words. So it does that magically. And then it has a deal with a, a piece of software called Lyrebird. And if you can train it up on one person's voice, you can add words that that person didn't say, mm -hmm. and it will speak them in their voice and fold that into the video if you want to do that. Right? Whoa. And that's, that gets into deep fakes and, and, and whatnot territory pretty quickly. However, if you had, you know, if you were trying to put together something you said and didn't say this correctly, you could kind of fold it in. It will not do that for video. So it won't, it won't do any tweening and fake your, you know, your head. It, I don't think it can do that, but it can do the audio. So that's really interesting. So that Descript could be a much easier way to do the edits of a gratitude video. Um, because I think that the, the, the job of actually cutting that up and moving it around is really time consuming and a real labor of love. 
and I think I don't know whether it was Lauren or Charles who were doing most of the, that editing. I think it was Lauren. Uh, but man, uh, she was putting in the time to do those things. And with that, I'll pause and I'll apologize to Stacy because we've just layered like 10 things on to the task that you put on the table, uh, which was a, a joyous, happy, hey, let's record some videos uh, of gratitude about people. And I, I don't I don't mean to like 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 overload the thing. We're just kind of riffing on the thing and then just wanted your thoughts. Oh, you want my thoughts? If you would. Oh, well, the thought I just had is when you mention something like Descript, now maybe I'm being naive, but I'm wondering why not go to a company like that and see if we could work something out with them? Um, I, that's in my head too. And I think we have to figure out what it is we want to do and show, but, but we could say, hey, we're a nonprofit. Uh, we would love to be your showcase. We would love to do some great things with it. And then you can advertise how cool it is by showing our, our work or whatever, that, that could be really cool. I mean, that, that, that would be, and there's no harm in approaching them and saying, hey, what do you think? Well, to go even further than that, there's no harm in trying to get something back financially to be able to use towards goods, good work. I mean, we're performing a service for them. Sort of true, although we should be in technically paying X dollars per seat per, per month for the privilege of doing so. And they're probably a startup without a lot of budget for supporting outsiders doing stuff, but they would pay media companies to create a good ad campaign for that. That's my point. Yeah, yeah exactly. So some, somewhere in that territory lies the range of the, the realm of the possible. Cool. Um, thank you. And, and thank you all for the, for, for the riff. <clears throat> um, let's take ourselves back into the generative commons. <laughs> I'm, I'm basically underwater here, and so is Hank, apparently, <clears throat> with his underwater ukulele players. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, mine, mine is a kind of a generative commons. I mean, they, they are in the same space. They seem to be uh, trying to do something together. They are generating something. So is that a good generative commons? Uh, I'm, I, I think that's a rhetorical question, uh, but that's why I, I chose this background for this. Uh, it's uh, nice, yeah. This <laughs> conversation. Um, I was away for a while, and I know that uh, Michael and and uh, I guess Stacy and and maybe Judith have been uh, uh, talking about this a couple of times when I was gone. I I did see one of the videos that was posted. Uh, so I'm, I'm interested in trying to make it a little more concrete for myself, because I talk about generative commons now to everyone. It's one of the things that, uh, that when people say, well, what are you interested in? I, I've, I've just grafted it onto what I have been calling in the past uh, uh, societal innovation labs or uh, distributed la labs for distributed collective intelligence or mission labs for uh, for addressing sustainable development goals or an innovation commons and to me uh, the whole label of being generative I first thought about it or heard about it in the work of uh, Otto Scharmer in uh, some of his uh, uh, early work uh, as he was still defining uh, dialogue and the U process. Uh, just he defined that at that time, must have been 10, 15 years ago, uh, four types of dialogue. Uh, and since I was working with dialogue, he became a big influence on my thinking. And uh, the, the first kind of dialogue was talking nice. And then if you can get through that, then you start talking tough. Uh, and that's where a lot of discussions actually end. So they don't really become a dialogue. And then you get a reflective dialogue uh, where people actually listen to what other people are saying, listen to what they themselves are saying, and they come to understand what people are all about and what they, they themselves are all about and what 
their words mean to other people and stuff like that. And that's as far as most people in dialogue sessions get. But he did define the fourth level, which he called the generative dialogue, in which you could use that information about what my words mean to me and what my words mean to you into generating something new that wasn't there before. New knowledge, breakthrough ideas, new relationships, etc. So I really like this, this concept. And, and in my work in dialogue in groups, every once in a while you do get a group that can have a generative dialogue. So it, it does happen. Uh, so when I came across the OGM, is talking about uh, generative comments, it seemed to fit right in. So I think I know what I'm talking about when I say a generative comments, but I'd like to be in a group like this group enriched with a, a few more people who would all be able to have a sort of reflective dialogue about what they really mean when they say generative or commons or an innovation commons or tagging a piece of information, which I thought was really uh, intriguing. Michael, I'd like to know more about that or, or the gratitude circle, and then see if we can actually generate instead of just deep understanding. So that's my opening comment. <laughs> Could not have asked for a better opening salvo. Um, and, I, and I would really love to see us generate a document of some sort that we can point to uh, and we, where we say this is our best guess at what the generative commons means right now and how to participate in it. That would be a great outcome. Um, other thoughts on anybody on what Hank just said? And it, it, just uh, by way of sort of uh, thinking through or following a moment for a moment on what Hank was just saying, let me just go in my brain to, I had a bunch of uh, similar things, but I don't have Sharmer's four kinds of dialogue, but I have uh, from the book, Leading from the Emerging Future, written by Otto Sharmer. There we go. Yeah. Uh, I have four kinds of listening. Yeah. Contribute, don't extract, uh, downloading, factual listening, empath empathic listening, and presencing, which is where the Presencing Institute and all that come from. Yeah. Uh, six levels of listening, uh, which shouldn't be called levels, I guess. Uh, <laughs> and this comes from what great listeners actually do, an HBR article from 2016 written by Jack Zenger and Joseph Folkman about listening well. I have a whole article about listening well. I mean, a whole article, a whole thought. Uh, here's uh, deep listening. Uh, all these things are kind of collected under here. And then when I when anything, I assume that these are connected here, but whenever I have a, th whenever I have a thing like the six, uh, six levels of listening, anything, I, I put that under a, a really fun thought called enumerated wisdom, which basically is a number, uh, you know, the four primordial, uh, come on, catch up with me, the four primordial teenage drives, the four rules of perm permission marketing, the, the four S's of intimate relationships, the four strategies of outrage managers. Yeah. And these go up into every other, like outrage management is very different from intimate, intimate relationships, right? <clears throat> so, so this is a really, really fun place to, to wander around and get lost. I'll, oh, I'll, yeah. put, the, I'll yeah. put the link in, in the chat. Um, it's also a great distraction from what we're, what we're up to right now. But yeah. uh, it, it might be, I, I Sharma developed the idea or took the idea under development from uh, Bill Isaacs. So uh, it, it might be in your brain on the Bill Isaacs. I'll get you a reference for it and, and uh, after the call and, uh, and I'll, uh, I'll mail it or I'll put it in the Mattermost. Sounds great. And you're reminding me of some things that, that like Sharma and Presencing have institutionalized or formalized or grooved and formalized is too strong a word, but in saying that there's these different kinds of listening and in then doing things that get people into the mode of listening well or better, they improve the conversation, they improve the dialogue and we in OGM aren't really using any of those tools. We're, you know, uh, we're just sort of wandering into topics and the, the way, you know, I think the tone we set is good and we're doing some of that, but we're really not using any of these other tools in ways that would be productive for us. And we probably, we probably could. And for instance, uh, 
Scott Mooring is a big fan of the DSRP framework from the Cabrera uh, Research Group. And uh, DSRP is distinctions. Uh, I'm forgetting what it is. I'll, I'll look it up. But, but it's a framework for analyzing systems. And it's a useful framework. It's like a pretty, it's a, exactly. That's all I do. I produce, I produce a clickbait. That, that's my job. I have a large hairball of clickbait. As, as, a, as, a, as a veteran um, magazine cover line writer, which kind of segued, <clears throat> segues into, you know, um, search engine optimization for lines and knowing, you know, you see these, these things that are in the corner of even the most responsible news stores that say, you know, 17 child stars and what became of them, you exactly. won't believe number seven. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly. the way to frame everything with that that magical number it, it's better if it's odd in discovery yeah yeah um, and uh so you know those those numbers are, are temptation totally makes sense and 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 this enumerated wisdom thought is kind of meant to be like a, a rabbit hole of rabbit holes <laughs> and it functions pretty well that way so so partly there's a bunch of methodologies or rules of thumb or, or group process practices or analytic thinking frameworks that we could harness and sort of apply to the stuff that we're doing. Um, and then as a side note, I'm really happy that Pete has sort of uh, put a fire under the emerging event sense-making process. Like, hey, the Delta variant is out. How do we actually filter our way through the way too much information and how do we present it in ways that are useful for people who love the information torrent, but also useful for people who can't take the information torrent, but need to know how does this emerging event affect my life? Like, what does it mean I need to think of differently or do differently? Um, and so uh, we had a, a conversation about that yesterday. And I think that that process will be pretty, uh, pretty interesting. Uh, Hank, thank you very much. That's wonderful. That's, that's a quick <clears throat> one just from, from uh, the first Google. Fabulous. Um, and I will add that to my brain after our call. Can I underline what you just said, Jerry? About, yes, please. Um, both in, in what people... color? <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. From my experience, uh, it should be a slightly fluorescent um, yellow or green. Okay. Pale green, bright yellow. Um, Sorry to interrupt you. Um, I couldn't resist. The, the, um, the idea that um, that emergent, um, <clears throat> emergent information um, be, I'm trying to remember exactly how you put it, you know, um, accessible to people who are overloaded and, um, and, and made useful by people who do want to deal with the, the flood. Um, <clears throat> when we were, we were having a conversation about how I mean, it, it was actually a conversation with, with Pete about Factor where we were talking about um, RSS inputs that were unvetted. <clears throat> and we were just talking about the idea of, of getting flows of information that had not, sense, sense had not been made of. Um, and <clears throat> this circles back to that, that tagging notion, Hank, that, that um, you, glommed onto too, where if there are people who, who are going through that flood and doing nothing more than tagging the things that seem to them to be either valid or representative of something that they're aware of or looking for, um, then the cumulative result of multiple people doing that on a, on a grand flow and, and doing it imperfectly is that the person who is overwhelmed, not, not in a position to do the filtering themselves, can come through and say, show me the information from this flow that has been you know, interacted with or tagged as opposed to everything and get this only the stuff even without knowing what tags they're searching for, get the stuff that has been tagged, that has some you know, validation, um, which, is, which is immediately you know, a, a great filter, a good filter, and then they can get to the great filter. Oh, I see among these things that have been, ta that have been tagged, 
the tags are, you know, climate change, um, uh, whatever, you know, food um, resiliency, and then go deeper. Yeah. Yeah. So what, um, so I put in the chat a couple things. One is like, maybe as somebody's busy filtering and tagging, maybe some of the tags are kind of like a die marker for the unproven sources. And, and maybe we also should have, maybe in factor or in this environment, we should have the ability to say, this source is, I'm still skeptical of until proven otherwise. And, and for me, a lot of entities prove themselves over time. Like I, I discover somebody who's kind of cool and I'm like, hmm, I'll watch but I'll watch sort of skeptically. Unfortunately, familiarity sort of breeds confidence. So it's like, uh, on the one hand, if I see their name often, I, this, is, this is the trick of advertising. It's like, God, that's a stupid ad. But the 15th time I see that ad and start singing their jingle, it feels like it's part of your life and you're, you're suddenly starting to trust them, even though it's a bogus product and, and whatever else. It's the magic of advertising. Um, but, but here, if we can actually sort of collectively include a layer of source confidence, uh, and this, this person has no qualifications to be talking about medicine and vaccines, yet has been forwarding fantastic information consistently over time and, and just gets more and more sort of con higher and higher confidence rating from the collection. And, and to be fully aware that if a bunch of alt-right QAnon people came into the same tools in the same community, they would use the same ratings to raise confidence on the alternate sources. Right. And you've got to be aware of that and be able to distinguish between and, and here of all this Krebs uh, are, are my friends. Uh, he did uh, basically he's been mapping social networks for four decades, maybe longer. Um, and he has a famous uh, map from back when about the books that liberals and conservatives are buying on Amazon and whoosh, there's just like this brilliant separation of clouds where all the blue people were reading this set of books and all the red people were reading this set of books and you could just see it in his visual. Um, and you're like, well, hell, that would explain why the narratives are really different and the belief systems really different, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so something, something, a radar kind of like that coming out of it where you could at least say, and, and you know, and then, then there's the open question about what do you do about the streams of lies that have now been tagged reliably but, are, but still exist in, in the sphere, right? And one, one of yeah. our major problems right now is, um, and, and here I'll refer to the, article, the brilliant article by Adrian Hahn, the game de developer saying, is QAnon an, an alternate reality game, an ARG? Because if, we've saw, if, if all of society is being run like a master plan uh, alternate reality game, with real world consequences, then, and, and if one of the tactics inside of that alternate reality game is to flood the zone with shit or misinformation or intentionally invent misinforming stories, which is what's happening right now. It's like, hey, the COVID vaccine leads to infertility and look here, look here, look here, look here, look here. It's like, holy crap. There's, there's like no evidence because there's no time passed because whatever. Um, so, so all of this, sorry, I, I just way complexified this thing, but, but I'm, I'm sort of also talking about the reality of uh, in an ideal world with well-intentioned uh, participants working toward each other to try to improve the, the filtering of bullshit, this would be a much easier task uh, in, in the real world where there's a bunch of people trying to destroy that very process. The, the process then needs to have some defense mechanisms. I mean, I right. think that, that for sure that that is true and a worry that we have not yet like had to face in any major way uh, on factor, but that like we really worry about. Um, and I think if we, if we, obviously if you, you know, if you populate um, a, a a platform, a set of platforms, a um, hashtag with uh, with people who are of somewhat similar academic, um, scientific strain. It'll be better at first, and then better at weeding out infestation of like non scientific thought. Um, but the better you know, one thing I was going to react to uh, in what you were saying about like evaluating sources is 
<clears throat> the more flat and mathematic, you know, you can make it um, before getting more sophisticated. Like I'm not scoring the quality of this source. I'm just noticing that of the things that have been um, tagged by the people who are tagging climate change, um, there are, you know, more from this source than there are from that source um, that are tagged as, you know, having veracity and worth looking at. Um, so I'm getting, I'm getting a sense when I look at that source by itself, I'm seeing strength in number of tags or percentage of tags um, on climate change where it might be weak on, you know, uh, popular music, <laughs> you know, whatever. <laughs> um, so um, that, that, that there's a source, there's a source metric there that isn't a personal evaluation though it's the result of some, you know, personal evaluations. Totally agree. Um, one remedy for the situation I was describing earlier is identity vetting. So if you allow anonymous posting, you get shit posts and there's no real way to corral it. If you have some kind of identity vetting, it tends to dampen that behavior. And there's that, so there's a bunch of other things one can do that change the dynamics in different ways. But then if you, if, if you ask for real names only, then people who are saying controversial but true things will be, will be hounded uh, and people's identities will be exposed even to trolls and other kinds of people. So that's a danger. So there's a, there's a bunch of interesting tweaks to do on even identity management, right? And that becomes, and if you're tackling anything interesting like sorting and filtering of information, that becomes your problem too, um, alas. Please, Stacey. I don't know the answer to this question, but a question I have is, what do you do about, there are certain people that are really reliable on one topic and just totally off on another. Yeah. Is there uh, that's, a solution? that's wonderful. And the example, <laughs> yeah. the example I used to give is, I used to, when, I, when I gave speeches or, or in, in like consulting sessions, I'd say, I have a friend, David Reed, um, who I would like to proxy my vote to for any issue that has to do with spectrum, bandwidth, telecom, like he has my vote, he can act as if, as if he were me on that realm of issues. I, I don't have any children, but I would not want him to watch my child. <clears throat> like, 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 no, he, he's completely distracted, unreliable in that, re you know, that realm of activity, not an expert, whatever. But, but in this other realm, he is 100% like black belt, top grade. Right, and and how do we how do we distinguish or differentiate? Then there's then there's the other problem of we tend to idolize the people who won, uh, many of whom were just really lucky or just really underhanded. Right, so they like Bill Gates has a huge bucket of money um, as a result of monopolistic practices that he and uh, Steve Ballmer basically enforced for two decades and killed off the competition. Mostly, they didn't manage to kill. In fact, at one point, they, they lent some money to Apple so that Apple could stay alive so that they yeah. weren't completely provably monopolists. Um, so they rescued Apple at one point. <clears throat> but, but, um, but some people's opinions are overweighted. Be and if you can show that they reliably offer bad judgments about the future, that's good, but it doesn't seem to discount them or, or, or you know, Make things any any worse. So, um, so what does that mean for what we're trying to do? Everything we just put on the table. Well, um, just to to what Stacy was asking and what, what you were talking about, um, I do think that a start. Again, I mean, we're 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 really in 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 factor zone. So I apologize that I'm bringing up. It's great Factors, because you, you, true, you're true for anything, but yeah, um, but you're a great use case for what, everything we're talking about. The idea for starters of, of allowing people tag themselves with what they perceive to be their the areas that they're knowledgeable about. Um, you know, our thought that, that that's a way to say, okay, 
show me the thing. You know, like I, I would, I would venture that the the person that you were talking about would not self describe themselves as as an expert in child rearing. You know, maybe maybe he or she would, uh, but uh, but probably not. And and so if we, if we go at least as a first cut with the stuff that you know people say this is the thing you really should listen to me on this is what I, I know where, where I know what I'm talking about yep. um, and they're willing to say it on their profile so it sort of puts them in the prove it mode um, then <clears throat> the 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 sort of second stage of that is um, having having a visible score that's mathematically derived, that sort of, um, this person says they know a lot about climate change. Other people who know about climate change agree with this person like a person of the time, you know, they both, they both tag the same content and, and kind of look at that mathematical output against each other so that if somebody sees boy i thought i was an expert in climate change but i see my score is really low there i think i'm going to take that off my profile because it's embarrassing um so you have a sort of self-regulating um now it's a um so there are some dangers there but i think it it might be a rough a rough start um that i don't know worked with I don't know if it's from my side, but your uh, Michael, your connection seems really video janky. Um, we're we're losing. We're dropped. We can understand you, which is why I wasn't interrupting. But we, your video is very hesitant, and it's dropping out a couple words. Um, okay. I can I can turn my video off. Um, and uh, I will be sad to miss your face, but you might get, have a more more <laughs> more luck with the audio. Um, and then I wanted to add something I added into the conversation. I think in Bilbo GM yesterday which was about Philip Tetlock and this whole idea of super forecasting, where he's, he's spent years now trying to find who are the super forecasters among us. Um, and one of the things you learn if you read super forecasting or his book on this, 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 this topic is that um, most people make proclamations that aren't actually good forecasts yeah. and are not measurable. Like, because there's sort of no date, there's no, there's nothing you can actually say this happened or didn't happen, or, or you could say, well, this happened only it was two decades after the person said it was going to happen or something like that. And, and so, <clears throat> and so one thing that's possible, and I'll just apply it directly to factor here, um, is factor could have a super forecasting module mode or just set of features that explicitly says, we're trying to implement some of these ideas from this dude, Philip Tetlock and others <clears throat> to figure out who, you know, who's a good forecaster. And so click here to add some features if you'd like to play in this pond. And what it'll do is it'll periodically ask you on whatever topic to frame a good forecast. And, and so there's a, there's a sort of a, a set of, a set of uh, hurdles or uh, expectations for what a good forecast is. It's got, you know, it's got a, a firm date, uh, a, a measurement of some sort, uh, and, and, and kind of a clean statement. Um, you know, uh, the Dow Jones is going to hit 45,000 by X date is like a way too simple version of it. Um, but you could factor could then help people improve their forecasting with feedback <clears throat> on what worked and what didn't work per individual. Factor could then help people um, earn a badge as a super forecaster because they consistently do this well. That would be really, really interesting. <clears throat> um, I don't know. I think, that, I think there's a, a bunch of stuff. And I met Tetlock at, a, at an event years ago. I don't know that he'd remember me, probably not. But I think I have an, you know, if you wanted to go talk to him and say, hey, how do we implement this? I might be able to open that door. Cool. Um, yeah, there, there was an, an, another, I'm trying to remember the name of the, the woman that we talked to, who was one of the super forecaster group that I think was Tetlock associated um, that were doing, they, yeah, they, I mean, they were selling their services, I think, in some cases, but they were doing a lot of experiments um, with how that worked. And, and that's for sure a really um, interesting idea as a, as a feature set. I was just like, you know, I like, I like the idea um, of, you know, 
would you like to switch to super forecaster mode? You know, you try it out. And, and maybe the idea also that um, there's an interesting new rating that follows participants on a platform, <coughs> opt-in only, but, but this interesting new rating actually helps a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, because there's, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in the minority report that gets squished out a lot. And, and one of the reasons for me proposing a new role in events called uh, story threaders is that I've watched way too many events where uh, at the beginning of the meeting, they had brought the right people in the room. There were some really interesting things said during introductions. And I'm like, that's really cool. That's really cool. And you could see the sparks of a great idea in there. And I'm like, I hope we get to do that a lot and talk about this a lot. That, and these things together could be like fantastic. And then through bad group process design, I would watch those ideas be snuffed out. Like over and over and over, very often the ideas would die when everybody clustered the post-its on a big wall and got voted on them and then clustered them into categories or into collective nouns. That was usually like, like the knell of death for, for the minority report, for the good little ideas. And the idea of story threading was to get people in with very different expressive skills, a poet, a super game designer, a simulation designer, a comics artist, uh, whatever, have them be in the meeting a lot so that they get to see a lot of these randomly distributed little embers and then say, hey, your charter is not to map all of the discourse in this meeting like a graphic facilitator is trying to do. Your charter is to pick up a minority report, add to it your own context, your own view of the world and tell the story in your favorite medium or whatever the best medium is for this story, right? Um, and so all of that to say, I'm a really big fan of the minority report in, in different sorts of events and situations. And right now, for instance, if you're a fan of ivermectin as a COVID protocol, you're in the minority report kind of, kind of category. <clears throat> and apparently the FDA has not conducted human uh, trials or approvals or whatever, but it's a drug that's completely, a, like it's been used forever. It's on the World Health Organization's approved drug panel, et cetera, for other purposes. It just happens to be really effective in treating COVID <clears throat> and yet it's not expensive. It's like insanely cheap. And so there's this entire conspiracy theory that big farm and everybody else are keeping it out because, because and it's like, hey, how do we create a quiet space where we can actually look at data about it and figure out what's going on? And, and I have one friend who's a doctor who's on one of my lists, who's like, hey, ivermectin people, um, you know, and I'm on another list uh, where uh, Carl Page, brother of uh, Sergey, uh, uh, Larry Page um, is busy saying, hey, people, ivermectin. And I'm like, it's interesting. Uh, and, and how do we how do we protect the minority report and at the same time defend from the minority report that's a QAnon person who's spinning a brand new but exciting conspiracy theory, right? Because yeah. that because that's how terrible conspiracy theories uh, uh, theories are also born. I want to plug uh, you know disaggregation and granularity uh, again as as like outputs for, you know, it's, it's very interesting in like conversations about um, uh, how we all work together and how different platforms work together and, you know, Trove and Massive Wiki and Factor and, and you know, things that, things that, other things that exist elsewhere um, <clears throat> that um, if something, if you, if you think about the output of our conversation right here or the kind of conferences you were talking about where a bunch of ideas come up and then they get group on, grouped in post-its and then something like doesn't really fit and so it gets lost. If everything that comes up is um, both placed in the sort of organized way in It's like, you know, every, everything that came up in this meeting, let's, let's imagine that we are a trove group. Um, mm -hmm. Everything in this meeting gets, is a resource that's associated with this meeting under this group in a place on trove. Um, 
we might generate from it uh, a, you know, something on Massive Wiki that was like more of a composed document that builds on those concepts. Um, on Factor or other platforms like that, the disaggregated items including the things that didn't really fit anywhere that maybe just had one or two tags on them um, are, are there loose for the finding to be associated with other things from other meetings that were smoldering embers that didn't you know, make it to the composed massive wiki, but are the things that you're talking about, which when you pull them together across the conversations in other groups can surface. They're, 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 they're like um, the, and, and they're the things that like when you think about, <clears throat> I mean, certainly it would be nice in the group setting for all of the, all of the stuff that's come up um, within one group conversation to be looked at by the comic artist or the, you know, the other, um, a uh, person who's going to have a different perspective, but you also want to put them out there in a more accessible, more widely accessible um, way where the, the fact that they've interacted with this group is part of its metadata. Um, and the, the tags that have been. We just lost the last sentence. Our, our metadata. <clears throat> We just lost what was after the tags that have the tags, um, the tags that have association. Uh, I see, I'm getting an unstable. No, mm -hmm. uh, I'll, I'll. You have to feed the hamsters in your router. See. I'll, yeah, right. Um, <laughs> I'll give it a try, uh, and just say that that those tags can be surfaced, those weak signals can be surfaced and associated in a more widely accessible way. Yeah. And the, you know, the comic artist can, the comic artist can be out there in the wild, not somebody that you found and discover these things and weave them together. Yeah. Um, as you were talking, Michael, I was realizing, <clears throat> maybe somebody does this already, but I haven't seen it that platforms that help us tag and disseminate information from Tumblr to Instagram to Factor to many, uh, many others and, and um, it, back, delicious back in the day and so forth. Pinterest, um, a Pinterest, a Pinterest a lot these days. Um, uh, and Pinboard, which picked up a lot of delicious users. Yeah. Um, it would be super interesting to have some analytic tools on top of the flows and to apply analytics to what's flowing through the platform and sure. not, just, not just trending tags, which everybody does, which is great, um, but uh, other kinds of tools from the different kinds of perspectives we've been talking about here. And probably five more that we, we would think about if we sat down and brainstormed that way. But wouldn't it be interesting to have different visualizations of what's happened on the platform in the last week or you know, it's a little bit like when you do the uh, Google noun search, what, what's the Google search called where you search for a term in literature over time? Oh, it, oh I don't know the name of it. Yeah, it, it, it basically word trends or phrase trends. And you can see that uh, uh, creative destruction, you can see that the phrase creative destruction sort of originates here so because there's a blip in the literature and then it tapers off and then it rises again when some other thing is, you can sort of see trends over time, which is really, 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 uh, really interesting. Yeah, that sounds cool. And, and, the, and I, I would also inject that um, the analytics tools be not like, you know, here's what we found, but here's a tool that you can use to find, um, you know, that, that, that the idea of having filters at your disposal that, you know, rather than an algorithm that's smartly set for you to find things are, um, you know, ways for you to say, I want to see only the things that are tagged this, that have been posted by this person that are from this source, whatever, um, that, that to me is really key. Yep, agreed. And, and for instance, 
On Twitter, I retweet a bunch of stuff. I hate that Twitter killed off all the alternate Twitter clients. I, I hate that. So I use TweetDeck now grudgingly. I wish there were more choice. <clears throat> um, and I don't use the Twitter main interface on the website ever because it's, it's not very functional. You can't really use it. But I retweet a bunch of stuff. I don't know what I'm retweeting. And I would love if there's a pattern. And I, and I as occasionally I'm like, oh, I seem to retweet this person a whole bunch. I'd love to meet mm -hmm. them. I wonder who they are, et cetera. But I don't really go there. I don't have the time. Yeah. I would love to know just the pattern of what I see and what it implies for the reliability of sources, right? <clears throat> and then some people create Twitter lists of people they follow. That's interesting. I've never created a Twitter list. I don't use the feature. And I, 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 my volume would increase too much if I subscribe to somebody's list. So I kind of have been hesitant to do that, except Twitter lists are one very simple weak form of saying, here's who I think is good and useful in this field. And that's interesting information too. But this meta information isn't being fed. There's like a triple loop learning opportunity in this field. So, so double loop learning is like correcting how you're doing the thing you're doing. Triple loop learning is fixing the system um, to improve it. And there's a, there's a triple loop learning opportunity in this field to instrument what's going through. Because once there's a torrent of info going through, once you've got like the Amazon flood in front of you, it's overwhelming anyway, might as, might as well analyze our way through it to, to make it better. Uh, Stacy, please. Don't sometimes people follow somebody not because they think they're reliable, but just to know what it is they're saying. I mean, Absolutely. when I watch Fox, I'm not watching Fox for <laughs> anything other than wanting to know what the narrative on the other side is. Completely. I yeah. totally agree. And, and, and actually, some people use Twitter entirely what I would say is wrong. Like my advice to, to people, to newbies is don't use Twitter like you use Facebook. Don't follow your friends on Twitter. Be very, very miserly about whom you follow and follow only really interesting people who seem to be saying the right thing. Or like you just said, um, people who are saying something that you feel you need to be in touch with or follow or <clears throat> understand what's up or whatever, whatever the right framing for that reason is. But, but if, you, if you curate who you follow with care on Twitter, your Twitter stream will be awesome regardless how much bullshit creeps into Twitter because you're not following people who forward the bullshit, <clears throat> right? And that, that's fine. Like, like a lot of people could attempt to flood the zone with crap and you might still actually have a fine experience on Twitter uh, depending on how you curate who you follow. That's all, that's what it takes. And that's just a quirk of Twitter. That's because that's kind of how Twitter works. Um, uh, uh, Hank, just as a side note, so I own storythreaders.com. I would love to stand that up as a platform to attract story threaders to make a living and be hired into corporate <laughs> events and conferences and other kinds of stuff to perform that role. I would love to be the Ur story threader with me and my brain because I know that I could exactly do that. I mean, I'm, I'm basically describing this role partly from my experience and what I know I'm, as a superpower of mine. And I've seen other people like Nikki Case creating simulations and Jane McGonigal building super games. I've seen other people at work doing stuff like this. And I think that if we like were to connect in on these concepts, there's a really powerful, one of the things that I see happening is that there's a bunch of new roles showing up that organizations will need. And, just, and the story I tell is, 30 years ago, you couldn't hire a graphic facilitator because it wasn't a thing. Nobody was doing it. And now every, a lot of people who've attended events have been there with, with somebody capturing the meeting on the wall. And you can Google for graphic recorder, graphic facilitator and find people and hire them. There isn't a single community of practice. So you can't wander through a bunch of people going yes, yes, no, but you can find them and hire them. I believe that 10 years from now, there will be a dozen new roles. And Pete talks about context weavers. Pete is a maven. I tried to convince Pete 20 years ago to buy the domain mavenology.com and, and train mavens like him, because he's a maven. And he's like, I'm just not good at training mavens. I'm a, like, he knows he's a great maven, but he didn't, he's like, I'm not good at training other mavens. I don't know how to pass on the skill. And I'm like, darn it, because organizations need people like Pete on hand by the bucket full to help the sense making. And they don't know it. That's they right, just, because they, just they don't, don't exist. know it yet. 
because they don't exist because we haven't brought this to bear. And, and the whole th story threader thing is a bet I'm making that I haven't put any money behind, that I haven't actually run through in pilot test because maybe it doesn't work. I don't know. Maybe, maybe it doesn't play out, but I have a funny feeling that if you drop people into a meeting with some skills and a charter to not report everything that happened faithfully, but rather to find the minority reports and, and call them out and, and paint them in a, in a compelling way, I have a funny feeling that that's really, really interesting and useful. I, I agree. <clears throat> you, should, you should do something with it. And in particular in, in futures work. So Hank, I say, yeah. this, I say this out loud because if you wanted to, if, if, you, if you or I or anybody found somebody who'd like to do that as the heart of their business, because for me, doing that and dropping OGM and everything else is not what I can do. And, but, I, but I'm happy to help stand this thing up and be the, the, the first story threader and let it go. And I'm happy to turn it over to somebody who wants to turn it into a business. That's a goal of mine. As they say in the Netherlands, you never know how a cow can catch a rabbit. Oh, that's so <laughs> profound. <laughs> Te technically, it's in, in the real translation, it's you never know how a hare uh, a cow can catch a hare, but because hare means different things in different languages, I always in, say it in English as a cow can catch a rabbit because everyone knows what a rabbit is anyway. Is it a hase in Dutch as well? An haas. An haas. Is a in rabbit. German, in German, it's a haase. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, if you put it out there enough, and I'll, I'll put it out there, and sometime there'll be a company that says, that sounds like a crazy enough thing to do. I'll, uh, if we, if <laughs> we build it, they will come. Let's take a risk. <laughs> yeah, People something like that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. No, I, I, from the first time you mentioned it, I thought it was a terrific idea. But now, this is the first time you told the story with the minority report which is a film I really like. Uh, so it's starting to come together in, a, in, a, in another way in my imagination. Cool, love that. And yeah. one, of, one of the story threaders ought to be somebody who's really good at, at uh, augmented reality simulations, right? Yeah. And, and can tell a story that way, which takes me over to Phelan More Life, who is an occasional OGM member who has a startup right now called Virgins XR where he's trying to build an, an extended reality environment where people like us, whom he calls path makers, can leave a trail in the real world of annotations and commentary, right? And, and Michael might be really interesting if what they leave is a trail of events and stories, right? Tagged up from factor with a geolocation. Sure. Hey, hey right. a, 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 fa a factor node with a geolocation is a tag in, Convergence, perhaps. I, th I think I was telling you that we our, our geolocation uh, feature is down, but we had it for a while, and man, it is an awesome thing to do. So yeah, I concur. I would love to. And and love and, and, and geography or geographic points are just one way to, to to anchor stories, right? And they're they're an interesting way, but they're in some sense they're a limiting way because sometimes the story is just not geographic, but but they're a beautiful and interesting thing to do. Um. And what, what's the reference to to uh, you? You start to talk about the pathmakers. So uh, this is uh, hold, hold on. So Phelan is uh, an OGM uh, member and occasional. Oh. He's he's in some of our conversations, but he's really heads down. He and Mark Tebow, um, who's also been in our. I think it's spelled that way. Um, both of them are occasional OGMers. Uh, Mark has been on a bunch of our Thursday calls and uh, they're cooperating to try to build up this platform called, I think it's Virgins XR. I, can, I, I don't know how much they have on the, on the inner tubes. Uh, -da -da. And Virgins is a, a term out of optics. It's sort of about the collimation yeah. of, uh, of optical uh, information. They don't have a. I don't think they have a website. But but if you uh, if you ping, I'm, ha I'm ha ping me if you want an intro or just ping Phelan through OGM or whatnot, um, and he you know he could tell you more. But he's he's right now at the stage of trying to get it funded and trying to figure out what's going on. I've been helping them refine their pitch, 
uh, and figure out like, you know, how, do, how does this work? Um, and it, you know, it, it's promising, but very, very young. It's not a, it's not a thing in the world yet. Um, and we've run over our hour. So I'm, I'm gonna say, if any, would anybody like to offer any thoughts in closing on this conversation? I thought it's another great conversation. Uh, just Stacy, were you there yesterday at the, oh, yes. uh, so at the, uh, what was it? The, the build OGM uh, call in the morning? No, the other one, the, uh, uh, the, food, Klaus, system, the food systems uh, Klaus, call, the, the and, uh, community food systems call. Yeah. I didn't realize. Uh, it was, it's an interesting group. I think it's going to do really interesting stuff. But at the end, we had to comment on it. And I said, there was no wow. It sort of missed an inspiration. And that's what I like about this call and these calls in general. There's always two or three wow things that I have to go away and keep thinking about. So thanks, everyone. This, this was really good. I love that. Thank you. And Michael, um, please don't apologize for representing for Factor and thinking about Factor in the, in the realm of what we're doing because, because one of the things I hope OGM does is appeal to vendors of software and platforms and encourage them to write toward the center, I call it. I don't know how better to say it, uh, toward interoperability, toward what the flotilla calls are trying to figure out, uh, you know, things like that. And, and so anytime something lights in your head that might be practical and doable, like that sounds awesome. And uh, no worries there, none whatsoever. Um, I'm still interested in us creating a document that smells like a generative commons agreement or document or something like that. We have a website, uh, a simple website. I would love to create a, I mean, we could create a Google doc. I mean, I have a starting Google doc, which I can share out with us um, that where we could just sort of kick around ideas about what to say and how to explain it. Let me just share that for a second. Yeah, because I, I was on it yesterday and I added a couple of new paragraphs. So oh. uh, yeah. Fabulous. Okay, I did not know that. Um, wait, I think it's this. Is it called Help Us Build a Generative Commons? Is that the document? Yeah, term? yeah. I just uh, Googled your uh, thing that you would put at the very start of this in Mattermost. Fabulous. So okay. here's the link to the document. Yeah. And if, if you want to wander in there, and the idea of this document <coughs> was an invitation to people to come in to these calls. This document was meant to be an email we would send to, to other people to involve them in these calls and, and do more of this. So I only managed to put a couple paragraphs in. Hank, thank you for elaborating. But if we can build stuff there, it's really, really simple to copy paste into a website. Um, yeah. And I would love, and maybe maybe next week we can start the call just uh, looking at the document and seeing what we can move toward. because. The more we can move OGM calls toward deliverables of any kind, the, the better, I think. Yeah, I, I, I really agree with you. And uh, I mean, I, I like this idea of the, of the rapid prototype and the best guess and not analyzing things to death. So uh, that's why I love these sparks of inspiration in these kind of calls. So I just put a few things there that represented what I was thinking yesterday. And if people want to comment or edit it or wipe it away, that's fine. But I think it'd be great if there were four or five or, or, or six people thinking together in, in, in a document. That sounds awesome. I love that. Um, cool. And then I'm afraid that I love mutual inquiry. Like, like collective inquiry or just uh, uh, the, 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 the collective sense-making thing is like the, my favorite thing in the world. And, and, and so I have, uh, uh, Pete calls it shiny object syndrome or SOS. <laughs> um, and and for, me, for me, it's like OGM bites off more than it can chew kind of on purpose. And so these conversations are necessary because they're generative in the sense of, oh, this could fit over there. And we should make, you know, if we tried that, it might lead to something really interesting that fixes a problem over here <clears throat> and so forth. And, and, but then we also need a bias toward action and toward building stuff and doing stuff. So just trying to make and that. It back just in. reminds me, sorry, I keep getting these thoughts now. The, the Chinese uh, dissident artist Wu Wei uh, uh, you mean Ai Weiwei? Uh, Ai Weiwei, yeah. And, he's, br he's brilliant and fabulous. I love him. 
a, a couple of a couple of uh, months ago, there was just a little article in a Dutch newspaper. Someone in, I think it was Switzerland, had a collection of 30,000 buttons and put that online someplace. And he bought them. Not that he had an, a project for 30,000 buttons, but he thought if I have them, some idea will come. So I think your shiny objects are probably like that, Jerry. He has a project where he... He hired a village in China to paint pebbles. Um, they're not pebbles. They were they were little grain. They basically made porcelain copies of a natural object, a seed, a grain. I'm forgetting exactly what it was. It wasn't grains of rice. That's too small. <clears throat> but they were they were kind of inch long objects, and they made <coughs> millions of them as a village. It employed the village for a couple of years. And his project was to pour these out on the floor of a large museum space and have people walk on them with the, re with the full realization that each of the grains was handcrafted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's one of his, uh, he's a genius. I got, to, I got to, I don't think I shook his hand, but I was at a conference where he was at a really long time ago. And somebody's like, that's Ivory Way. Yeah. And so I got to stand near him, but not shake his hand. And he, dude is just off the charts brilliant. His, his, ha his hacks of the system and, and living in China, you know, trying to fight what China does. His father was a famous poet uh, oh. who got banished, basically sent out to the, gul the, the Chinese equivalent of the gulag. Um, and then they got kind of reinstated, you know, uh, back into society. Anyway, um, thank you very much for these very generative conversations. Yeah, it was great. Seems so Bye -bye. appropriate. Bye. Thanks.